that. Well, I have wonderful news today. You've heard of the word gospel, which means good news. What is the good news that we preach? We're approaching Easter. The resurrection. How wonderful is that? I'm afraid, though, sometimes we get so caught up in the message, we forget the meaning. And we really don't get the impact within our own hearts. So I want to give you the best news, perhaps, that you will ever hear. This is the greatest news ever. You don't have to die to experience heaven. Really? I want to talk about heaven on earth. Because I think a lot of times as Christians we think, Oh, I'll fly away, I'll fly away. Someday I'm going to be there. When I die, it'll all be wonderful. But the promises of God are for us here today. The blessings that God has for us are for us today. So heaven and our experience of God's glory, God's plan is for that to be now, not later. I don't know about you. But sometimes I have trouble really believing that. This is a little bit of a struggle for me at times because things don't seem to be going quite right. And I wonder, oh God, How's this going to work out? So I gave you some notes for you to look at. And I assume that you were visiting with people today and you didn't read it. Is that right? <laughs> but it's a nice story that you may have read before. We're not going to take time to read it because there's just not enough time to do all that. But we'll talk about the story and some interesting things about the story that maybe you never thought about. At the bottom of all the notes are some questions that you can use to get yourself to thinking about different possibilities. I'll share some ideas. Maybe you'll have some questions at the end. But it is a rather amazing story about the resurrection of one of Jesus' best friends, a man by the name of Lazarus. <clears throat> And of all things, what Jesus didn't do is what we would expect him to do when we have a request of him. Lazarus is sick. Come fix the problem. How many of us have come to the Lord with a problem and expect God to come fix it? <laughs> and what does Jesus do but not do? He just stays there. For another couple of days, he waits until Lazarus has died. You know, I've had a few experiences like that where I wanted God to meet my need and it didn't happen and it didn't happen and it didn't happen. And finally, I gave up. I surrendered it all to the Lord and only then did I see God's glory. I wonder if Mary and Martha would say, yeah, let me tell you my story. Because you know, this was a real event. It really did happen. I am somewhat amazed that Matthew, Mark, and Luke didn't tell the story. John was the last gospel to be written. And I feel sure that John said, you've got to be kidding me of all the different stories that have been written about what Jesus did, this one should never be missed because of all stories, it is extremely important. Notice one thing that Jesus said to Mary and Martha. It's in your third bullet note where Jesus says, those who are living and believe in me will never die. What I want to propose to you is the more you walk with the Lord, the more you experience heaven on earth. And the more of heaven on earth that you experience, 
the more you can be content no matter where you are. Because the good news really is we get to walk with the Lord. You know, that's the way it was in the beginning with Adam before he sinned. He got to walk with the Lord in the cool of the evening. Now, that is the best definition I know of, of, quote, cool. <laughs> to walk with God. Unbelievable. What a great thrill. And there's an indication that we can do that today. Jesus said it. Did Mary and Martha believe it? Because both Mary and Martha, when they met Jesus, and their brother had already died and been buried and been dead for four days, they both said the same thing to Jesus. Well, Jesus, if you had just come, he wouldn't have died. Lord, I've been praying all this time, and if you had just come, I wouldn't have this problem. You ever feel that way? I do at times. And that's when I need to be on my knees, I think. That's when I need to pay some attention to God's provision and understanding that he might have some plan different from what I can see. Could be. Maybe so. A lot of very interesting things happened in this story that involved people other than Martha and Mary. Do you know that you are part of a much broader story than the universe that now circles around you? You are the center of the universe. From where you sit, the world is all out here. Is that right? And God's right there available in the center of your universe. But your light shines and affects everybody around you. This particular story that John chose to reveal to us is amazing. Why? Because we know that this event was the catalyst that brought about the directive that led to the crucifixion, arrest and crucifixion of Jesus. Could anything be more crucial in telling the story? Because, as best we can assume and presume from the context and all that we know about the situation, Lazarus had been a member of the Sanhedrin. And he had died. John, typically when he refers to the Jews, is talking about these narrow-minded religious leaders who really didn't have much appreciation for Jesus. When he refers to the, those are the Jews. Now, that doesn't mean all Jews, obviously. But when John is referring to those people, he tends to refer to those who were part of the Jewish leadership who had wanted to kill Jesus from the day that the money changers were cast out of the temple. Because Jesus upset their religious order and they were not at all happy about that. Well, but Lazarus was part of the Sanhedrin. And when he died, there were Jews from Jerusalem who went to comfort Mary and Martha. And when Lazarus was raised from the dead, some of them became believers. That's what the Bible says. You read it in the story. Some of them became believers. But some of them also went and told the Pharisees. They went back and, because even after they had seen the miracle, they were still attached to their problem that wasn't being satisfied and they went back. <clears throat> and that led to the decision of Caiaphas that one man must die for the saving of Israel. A quote, prophetic word. And in a way, that was true. That might make for some interesting discussion because one man did die for the saving of God's people, didn't he? But certainly Caiaphas' motive for that wasn't the right motive. So how is it that we can experience more of heaven on 
earth. You'll see in your notes, Matthew 6, 9, and 10 is part of this, what we call the model prayer, the Lord's Prayer. I find it difficult to believe that we should be given a pattern of prayer for which there is no purpose. That makes no sense, does it? Surely if we are going to pray for something, there should be some effect of that or some purpose in it so that what we pray would be for it to happen. And we're asked to pray that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Can you understand the magnitude of that? Now, I look at what's going on around me and I'm thinking, Lord, we're not coming close. <laughs> if anything, we're getting worse. Have you noticed anything like that? Okay, Jesus. You, you, your name's written down there. Some of my Bibles print that in red. That means you said it. And I'm believing you said it. So how is your will on earth being done? Once you know God's got a problem. He made us with free will to choose what we want to choose. Meaning, he can't make the right choice for us. And no matter how hard somebody might be praying for me, if I don't want to walk with the Lord, I don't have to. So here is God, not willing that any should perish, and yet many are. Do you see where we might have a little problem here in saying, Lord, let your will be done on earth when all these other people are not listening and not following and not recognizing God's presence? His presence is here. Do you know Mary and Martha when they said, well, Lord, if you had just been here, he wouldn't have died? Look at where we are now today and what we know about the presence of God. He's here. God is here. God can intervene where he wants to. We can't use this reasoning that Mary and Martha used. Well, Lord, if you had just been here, you could do something. He's already here. So what's the holdup? To let your will become my will. I need to surrender my will to your will. You see how this works? My choice. God not forcing his will upon me. I must choose his will. Why would I do that? I must understand the value of doing that. We've been learning about the Israelites and some of the things that happened in the Exodus from leaving Egypt all the miracles that God did among the Israelites. And when we stop to think about it, we should be in awe of the miracles. Imagine what it was like to be among a couple million people who left Egypt and now they are traveling across the Red Sea with a wall of water on each side and there is no way that that could ever happen other than the power of God. And this is after all the things that God had done with the plagues in Egypt. Time and again, God showed his favor to the Israelites. And yet, after all of this, what do they want to do but to raise up a golden calf to say this is the God who delivered us? Is that amazing to you? It is. But it tells us something about human nature. When our eyes drift away from God, what happens is we forget his miracles. We forget the things that he has done so wonderfully for us and start looking at the things where we would say, but Lord, if you were just here, you would take care of me. You're not taking care of me the way I thought you should, so you must not be here. But he is. He is here. So what did the Israelites do? 
after all the miracles, we're complaining and God gives manna. And now we're complaining because we want meat. And now we're complaining because we want water. Do you see a pattern here? God is satisfying us with our needs and we are dissatisfied because of his insufficiency in supplying our wants. Oops. It's a problem for me because I have to learn to appreciate the struggles and the things that I am walking through with him. Can I do that? Can you do that? Good question. I think it comes down to asking this. Are you living God's glory or are you living God's tragedy? We can always, Israel proved it, we can always find a tragedy for which we lack something. Yes, we can. And so often that is exactly what we're doing because we forget that God provided the manna. We forget that God did this. We forget that God did that. And now we're wanting to know this time, why God have you not answered? So as we experience God's presence, then we get to live heaven's glory. So how do we do that? Well, let's look at a verse in our notes. In John 17, 22, in the area, this is the area that's called the high priestly prayer, in which God is revealing something about himself and his desire to be one of us. Jesus prays an interesting prayer concerning the disciples. Jesus said to the Father, I have given them the glory that you gave me so they may be of one spirit with you as we are. Would you agree that Jesus had an amazing relationship with the Father. But it was not without struggle. And certainly we see a picture of that in the garden where Jesus prays, if it's possible, Lord, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. There was some unity with the Father in which Jesus could stand up in the boat and say, peace, be still, and it immediately happened. Now, how do you do that? Jesus reached out and healed people. He didn't heal everybody that he walked by. He picked out one man at the Bethesda pool. He picked out one blind man. He passed up the lame man at Gate Beautiful. Peter and John were instruments in his healing. But time and again, Jesus saw the healing of different people because of his relationship with the Father. What we sometimes, I think, miss is the fact that Jesus, being human, with the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in him, being our pattern of what is possible in our relationship with the Lord. Have we gotten there yet? I haven't. I don't expect that any of us have. But it is definitely a worthy goal. And it seems to be part of Jesus' prayer when he says, Lord, God, Father, let the relationship I have with you be the relationship that they can have with you. They got a taste of that on the day of Pentecost. And I think it grew some. Sometimes I see different people struggling and I say, oh, I wish I could just share a little bit of what I know, what I experience, but I can't. Or at least I can't do very well with it because each of us individually have our own walk from where we are to where God wants us to be. 
And each of us must follow the prayer that Jesus gave us in the model of model prayer when he says, what did he say? Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Watch this. Lord, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's not the way to point because these people can't surrender at your will, but you can. So here's where the prayer has to be directed for me. Lord, let your will be done in this earth, in me. If your will is done in this earth, then he and I are agreed. Do you know the Bible says two people can't walk together unless they're agreed? We can't really walk with the Lord and experience the Lord unless we're in agreement with where God has us right now. I want to apologize for popular Christian preaching that says that God wants something different from what he has given us right now. That's the kind of preaching that the Israelites were led to complain and say, God, you haven't given us what your people deserve. That's the kind of attitude that Miriam and Aaron had when they said, Moses, who are you to be on the high place? We are God's leaders too. We ought to be up here at your level. It's the sort of thing that led Korah and his people to, to say, well, hey, wait a minute, we're Levites. We, we ought to be able to have these privileges too. What's wrong with all of this? We are comparing ourselves with others instead of identifying our own individual relationship with him. We have to do that before then we can begin to see God's might and God's power in the midst of the struggle. Until then, we will continue to complain and we will continue to say, God, why? Why am I in this situation? Why are things not going right? Some time ago, I learned to change my prayer about that because things have not gone the way I thought they would. They certainly haven't happened the best way that I could imagine. Things happen differently. And I learned to quit asking the why question and start saying what? Because I know God to be in absolute control. He can intervene, he can do whatever he wants to do. The fact that he doesn't do it is an action on his part. So God, this is not what I expected. What are you going to work in this? What are you doing? I know you, do, you are doing something. I know you are a God who causes all things to work together for good. So I put it up, what, not why. Why makes God accountable to me, but what makes me accountable to him. I want to know how I can be a part of what he wants to accomplish. And as I do that, I get to walk with him. I know because of your relationship with the Lord and some of the things that he has brought you through, you have a miracle story to tell. Why haven't you told it? Maybe you have. Why haven't you told it more? Maybe you have. What I want us to realize that if we want to experience heaven on earth, one of the best ways to do it is to tell our stories of walking with him. Every time you do that, you get to walk with him fresh. You know why? Because he's right here in you, walking with you as you tell the story. And you are beginning to fulfill 
your purpose. Didn't Jesus say that we were here to bear fruit? The way we bear fruit is to not sit down at the dinner table and eat more. As much as I like to eat. The way we bear fruit is to give to others. And what can we give to others that's worth all that much except spiritual food? And what is that? It's the good news. We don't have to die to see heaven. We can live in walking with the Lord and enjoy heaven on earth right now. But to show that, the best way to do that is to tell our story. Praising God, worshiping God, that's wonderful. But you know, that's not what Jesus spent his time doing. If you read anywhere in scripture where Jesus said, oh, we need to stop here now and I just need to praise the Lord. I'm sure that he had worship for the Father. That's not what I'm saying. But I want to point to the latter chapters of John where John said, I have glorified you. Well, if it wasn't by singing songs and saying wonderful things about the Father, how did Jesus glorify the Father? It says it in Scripture. You ought to read the book sometimes. It's really pretty good. <laughs> he said, I have glorified you by doing the work you sent me to do. So where are we? Who are we? What are we doing? Only you can answer that question for you. And you can't compare yourself to anybody else because everybody else is in a different situation. The question is, I have to ask myself, God, what do you want of me? I want you to know that I eat, sleep, and breathe the opportunity to please the Lord. And that's not only been true since I've been a freelance writer and speaker for the last 15 years. It's been true for about 50 years. I want you to think about this a minute. Who do you work for? Do you have an employer? Do you have a retirement check? Do you depend upon a government handout, a Social Security check. That's not exactly a handout, is it? We kind of earned that, I thought. But we're dependent upon other things. Who, who do we owe to? Are we dependent upon a relationship? Are we living for a relationship? Think about it in these terms, because I've always looked at it this way, and I can tell you it's really a healthy approach. I've always looked at the signature on a check, anybody's check, and I see that is evidence that I'm working for him. We all have different bosses and different people we answer to in a family relationship. We work for a spouse, we work for our kids, we even work for friends, we may even work for neighbors. We work for a lot of different people in different relationships for different reasons and different rewards. But let's keep it, keep the order where it needs to be. God's our big boss. He signs my paycheck. And his will is more important than my job. His will is more important than my paycheck. His will is more important even than my own health because I'm his. I belong to him. So think about that. How are we doing? We run out of time already. See, I'm amazed at how quick 30 minutes can go by. <laughs> I, I knew I wouldn't have enough time to talk about all the things I wanted to talk about. So there we are. I've got to quit with this. And let us talk a little bit about it. Up the, down at the bottom, you see some different questions. Did any one of those stand out? Or is there any comment you have with any of those that you would want to talk about? I have some comments. I, I did not know before today, and I realized that John was the only one who wrote about this story. And, and you helped me understand the significance of it in the connection to the crucifixion. Without this chapter in the, the Bible, we wouldn't have the verses, I am the resurrection and the life, and Jesus wept. 
Yes. You know, so I want to thank you for enlightening us today with that information. And so you said that, Jim. Let me just add a couple of other little details that we don't have start enough time to talk about. But Mary and Martha probably were not at the crucifixion. Had they been, they would have most surely been mentioned. They missed that part of the story. They weren't part of the anointing of Jesus' body. They weren't part of the resurrection. Where were they? What were they? Think about that. Uh, were they maybe being a host to some of the disciples that ran when Jesus was arrested? Perhaps. To expand this picture just a little bit, most of us don't realize this because it's not part of this story and it's not recorded in any of the other Gospels. But in the next chapter, in John 12 instead of John 11, when, when they're going to kill Jesus, Jesus was not the only one who received a death warrant. Did you know that? It says it specifically in, Chris, in, in Scripture. Lazarus was to be killed as well. That's right. So the idea that this wasn't a real threat, no, 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 this was a very real threat to more than just Jesus. It was a threat to Jesus and his disciples of which Lazarus was chief. So it's rather interesting. We need to take comments and questions here. <clears throat> Frank, um, as part of God's plan, Jesus knew if he waited Yes, he did. Days, yes. It would have a much greater impact for the kingdom, but it was part of God's plan because it also led to his crucifixion. So if he had just come and, you know, healed him from being sick, it wouldn't have had the effect. Lazarus won more people to Christ in Jerusalem. That's why he got the death warrant. That's right. And this was all part of God's plan. That's right. I have um, two friends, Sarah Davis and Letitia Wheeler. Sarah is, is a beautiful black woman. Letitia is mixed. And of course, there's me, so we make the three musketeers very unusual. But, but I'm producing with them in, in sometime this year a, a women's conference called The Power of One. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting because it's based on this very scripture. The idea that it seems like in our society, everything is being done to divide us. Yes. You know, to polarize us against one another. And yet the very last prayer that Jesus prayed, and this was such encouragement to me, frankly, because we just met just a few days ago. And the idea is it's hard because it's not a popular message. Everybody want not everybody, but a large group of people want us. There's a vested interest in us being divided yes. and fighting against one another. We yes. know that a house divided against itself won't stand. That's the right. country, same thing. So the Lord is raising us up to do the power of one. There's one God, one mediator, through one man through whom we can, all can be saved. And he wants us to be one with each other. There's power in yes, one. That's right. and, and this was such a, a confirmation to me, but a blessing to me in recognizing that we are on the right track. But it's also coming at a price, you know, because mm -hmm. being one is not popular right now, but there's power when we are one. Yes, it's just a good. blessing. So I think and we, we are one family because we are of one blood. That's right. And I'm not talking about our skin color. That's right. I'm talking about a relationship with the Lord. That's what makes us one family. It really yeah. is. It is powerful because it is it is not just a some spiritual goals, uh, or not rather some psychological platitude or, or some philosophy. This is a spiritual reality that we are really connected with the Lord and we have him in common in all things. Makes us want absolutely very good thing. Anybody else? I saw it thumbs up. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Can will we be encouraged in all that? And can can this be something that will say, "Okay, Lord, I, I want to spend more of my day walking with you." You know, the Apostle Paul said, "Pray without ceasing." He's talking about our attitude in walking with the Lord. So let me pray. Lord, thank you 
so much for your presence that we can know is always here in everything we say and do. And that we can experience your glory here so much so that we really have a little difficulty wondering how it could be much better walking with you through the fire, through the problems, through the difficulties. You can walk with us in it. We can experience your glory in it. And then, Lord, it's just not much of a transition when we experience heaven in heaven because we've experienced so much heaven on earth. So I ask your blessings upon each one here in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good job. Thank you so much, Frank. And I do want to mention that Frank brought his books with him again today. And it's the Discussion Bible. You can buy the whole New Testament in one volume. You can buy it in two volumes. He's also got um, Psalms and Proverbs and Genesis and Exodus. So stop by his table, see his books. All checks can be made out directly to Frank Ball. So thank you again for coming. We'll see you next week. Happy anniversary. Yeah. Yeah.